Hi there, and welcome to the Cotswold Explorer. I'm Robin Shuckborough, and we are exploring the beautiful region of the Cotswolds in southwest England, following in the trail of Herbert Evans, who cycled around this region and wrote about his experiences in this wonderful book, The Highways and Byways in Oxford and the Cotswolds, published in 1905, 114 years ago. In our last programme, we visited Steeple Aston, Deddington and Adderbury. As we leave Adderbury Church, our visit only slightly impeded by the restoration work that's going on here, and pleased that their work means that your visit in the future will be all the better for it. You might have expected us to travel just a couple of miles north of here to Banbury. Indeed, our indispensable guide, Evans, from over a hundred years ago, chose Banbury as his base for a few days. But we've decided not to visit this important town, and you deserve an explanation for this. I'm absolutely certain that Banbury's full of worthy people running wonderful businesses, and they'd be delighted, of course, to see you. And whilst the town is certainly one of the most important in Oxfordshire, famous, of course, for its cross and its cakes, for us, it's just a step too far from the Cotswolds. Also, at the risk of visiting the sins of the fathers upon the sons, it is the site of two of the greatest acts of vandalism in the history of the county. The magnificent castle was entirely demolished after the Civil War, probably the most important royalist stronghold in the whole country. But less understandably, and perhaps more importantly, the beautiful cathedral-like church, widely thought of as one of the finest in Oxfordshire, was demolished in 1790 by the burghers of Banbury, simply for the want of a little money for running repairs. Of its replacement, Evans writes as follows, the stranger who inquires his way to the church will find to his amazement a hideous square mass of stone without form or proportion. If he enters, he will not care to linger, for he will soon have seen enough to convince him that he has at last reached the nadir of ecclesiastical architecture. So we are not going to subject you to it. Instead, we're going to head due west of here to the first of several small villages that surround Banbury and have interesting stories to tell. It's called Bloxham. Come with me. As we head towards Bloxham, we're driving along the ridge between the Swear River and the old Cotswold railway line. On our left, you can see the masts of a 20th century communications centre, and to the right, the remains of the railway that served the mines and smelters of Hook Norton, which we will visit later in our journey. The railway was closed down in the 1960s, when the politician Richard Beeching cut huge swathes through the rail networks of Britain. Evans writes of Bloxham, the Bloxham people are naturally proud of their lofty, crocketed spire. Round the octagonal base from which it springs is a broad band of elaborately carved stonework, which they call the Alice. When viewed from a distance, this band has all the effect of a wreath loosely encircling the spire. Inside the church, we're struck by the light that streams in through the lofty, clear windows particularly in the south transept, known as the Thornycroft Chapel, giving an atmosphere of peace and tranquillity, and lighting up the marble image of Sir John Thornycroft, resplendent in flowing wig and loose morning gown. He lived, in the 17th and 18th centuries, in Milcombe Manor, about two miles south of here. After a brief but fascinating visit to the small local museum right next to the church, we're now heading south to Milcombe, to have a look at Thornycroft's dovecote. The Milcombe dovecote, which you can see behind me, was built by John Thornycroft when his manor was in this village. His manor house is long gone. The dovecote was an important part of their lives in those days because the idea of feeding animals through the winter had not really been established. So the meat availability was extremely limited during the winter. And so the pigeon offered a constant supply of meat. So the landed gentry around here built pigeon lofts like the one behind me, this big dovecote, uh, and they bred pigeons for the table. 
They were the only ones allowed to do it. Of course, they didn't allow their tenants to have any kind of, of, of access to these birds because the birds have long since been recognized as a pest for their crops. But the rich needed their meat. And that's what this building is all about. We'll come across several more of them in our travels. You may remember one at Rausham. Uh, we will no doubt discover many more. Sadly, it's difficult to get to see the inside of this dovecote. It belongs to the Chowell District Council, and the rules appear to stipulate that to get inside, one must apply for a key and then be accompanied by an officer of the council. The doorway shows little sign of having been opened in the last few years. We're heading north now to visit the village of Broughton, where lurks one of the most spectacular buildings in the county. Broughton Castle is the home of the Fiennes family, Lords of Say and Seal. In the 15th century, William Fiennes, the second Baron Say and Seal, married the great-great-granddaughter of the sister of the founder of New College Oxford, William of Wickham. She brought the castle with her. William's father, the first Baron, was the unpopular Lord Say in Shakespeare's Henry VI, who was beheaded by Jack Cade. During the Civil War, the Fiennes family were strongly parliamentarian and they raised a small army known as Lord Say's Bluecoats, who did good service at the Battle of Edge Hill but surrendered to the King shortly afterwards. There is a room at the top of the castle still known as the Barracks, where the soldiers were billeted. Broughton illustrates clearly the effect of the 20th century. Evans wrote in 1905, Besides the castle and the rectory, there are only some half dozen scattered houses to be seen. These days, the population of Broughton is 1,700 souls. The journey from Broughton to Roxton, our last destination in this episode, is just three miles. Just before the entrance to the village, we find an ancient signpost of which Evans wrote, it consists of a stone pillar with the names of the towns towards which the divergent roads lead, carved upon three of its sides, while on the fourth is an inscription recording the gift of this handpost by Mr. F. R. White in 1686. Turning right into the village of Roxton, and right again into the old village, we come to the entrance of Roxton Abbey. Evans tells us that in 1905, getting permission to enter Roxton Abbey was difficult. He suggested trespassing a short distance up the drive to get a view of this fine 17th century mansion. These days, it's occupied by the highly distinguished Fairleigh Dickinson University from the United States, who took on the lease in 1964, and now they open up their gardens to us all. As long as we respect the grounds, and don't take picnics or dogs. There are a couple of other restrictions, like hunting, but despite all this, the brilliance of the gardeners and the commitment of the health of the building from the new owners makes this a sensational place to walk and dream of living the life of an English aristocrat. The village that surrounds it is probably second only to Bybury in its perfect picture postcard depiction of medieval Cotswold life. Indeed, it's barely changed since Evans rode through 114 years ago. Next week, we're headed northwest to Edge Hill, the very northern tip of the Cotswolds, and the site of the first pitched battle of the Civil War. This is where, on the eve of the battle, my ancestor Richard Shuckborough was knighted by Charles I and opportunities were missed by the Royalist army that led eventually to their defeat and the rise of the parliamentarians. We'll see you there. But don't forget to subscribe to the channel. It's free and you can keep up with the story as we tell it over the next few months. <laughs>